So welcome to this CBMM seminar. It's a pleasure to have today Maya Fraser from the University of Ottawa. Uh, so Maya has a kind of a diverse background. She, she got a first PhD in math from Stanford, and then she went on to work in industry in high-performance computing for a few years. <laughs> and then she went back to get a second PhD in computer science from the University of Chicago and start to work on machine learning related topics. And I guess that's around the time when we met, when we were trying to figure out mathematical models of uh, uh, the visual cortex model that uh, Tommy was working on at the time. So uh, Tommy, uh, Steve Smale and I were discussing about this stuff and uh, we had multiple discussion with uh, Maya in Hong Kong at the time. And then she went on to work at the University of Toronto as a postdoc and she's now a faculty at uh, University of Ottawa. And so, pleasure to have you here. Yeah, so thanks very much and uh, thanks uh, for the invitation. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, so actually I should say I expected an informal uh, talk in a, in a lab meeting. I wasn't uh, <laughs> expecting this at first. So um, I've, uh, I'll try to uh, um, sort of highlight some general themes and ideas without uh, getting mired in, in too much uh, technical math details. Um, and well, so maybe one thing I can say, just this uh, illustration here, so that's just a, um, uh, to, to kind of emphasize that uh, I'm going to try to talk about hierarchy and some ideas about uh, um, the usefulness of hierarchy, but a little bit different from the typical um, deep versus shallow question. And so that's why I've kind of chosen a different uh, picture. This is like some artist's rendition of a, of a molecule. And um, so it actually, um, I have a, a ongoing collaboration with chemists. And there's all sorts of, uh, it's really been eye-opening to see the, thanks, <laughs> um, kind of the magic that's going on even at that level. And so just in general, we have these very complex biological organisms. And there's hierarchy involved. And, so let me just uh, kind of first uh, uh, specify the terms a little bit. Uh oh. Okay. So just to explain what kind of hierarchy I'm, I'm going to um, be asking this uh, question about. Uh, so here are sort of uh, typical, so various uh, feed forward neural network architectures. And often when people are asking a deep versus shallow question, at least in computer science, they're, they're referring to architectures like this. And this is actually a collage made by, um, out of this lab from uh, um, Andre Wibisono and, and yourself um, from a, 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 some lecture many years ago talking about this deep versus shallow question. Um, so these are various architectures with the, the kind of uh, references underneath. But I want to look more broadly, so um, at biological hierarchies. And so in the previous slide, those were architectures that are modeled after uh, peripheral uh, regions in the brain, sort of uh, mostly visual cortex, or at least stages of visual cortex, but could be auditory cortex, where similar principles are, are at work. But of course, um, in general, the brain is much more complicated. And this is obviously a highly simplified picture as well. And so admittedly, it's not a hierarchy. It's much more complex than that. But it's still true that uh, um, you know, from some sort of uh, um, stimulus uh, to the actual um, action or um, perception of, a, of an individual or agent, um, at least part of the process is proceeding in hierarchical fashion. And I also kind of wanted to emphasize over here that there are parts of this uh, sort of control that are happening even outside the brain. So this is uh, an illustration with, um, you can't really see it too specifically, but ce uh, central pattern generators. And um, so the learning that's happening in each is, first of all, there are these various modules. And also the learning that uh, happens in, in each of them is happening in very different uh, sort of time scales. And some things may be hard coded already genetically. So that's learning that's happening on an evolutionary scale. And there's also sort of multi-scale aspects in that uh, the higher regions need the lower regions need, need to access these modules and right down to you know, the level of, of proteins and all the kind of behavior that goes on at that level. So um, I should also, so these are the references for the various figures, but I should also make a disclaimer. I'm not a neuroscientist at all. So <laughs> I just have some certain collaborations with neuroscientists and that's a big source of inspiration for trying to understand what machines can do. 
as everybody here uh, sort of uh, um, is, um, is very aware. Um, and so mostly I work on kind of the um, mathematical machine learning side, trying to come up with mathematical principles that help understand. So of course a mathematical formalism is necessarily a simplification. And it's interesting when it, um, it gives you some kind of insight about what might be going on in a problem. And sometimes then it also gives you sort of general principles that allow you to design other things. So that's kind of the angle um, from which I'm approaching this. Okay. So just to, to recap, um, and maybe I want to emphasize in that uh, earlier slide where we saw the various feedforward architectures, the, a lot of the themes that were happening there are still relevant here. Um, in, in what I want to consider today, but um, I want to allow the possibility of learning with one kind of data at one stage before one builds on higher stages. So that's um, not a whole architecture at once learning, but learning in, in modules. And this learning then can be progressive so that one um, unit has been optimized before one then recalls on it from a, another area. And also, just in general, this sort of theme of multiple uh, space and time scales throughout. Those are kind of some of the main sort of messages I want to um, build on. OK, so I'm going to call this kind of learning, um, or this kind of hierarchy, multi-step learning. And by that, I just mean that uh, the training can happen in multiple steps. So we can train with one data set, and then later train um, a further machine that calls on the originally learned um, module. And so in that kind of context, I want to consider what are the benefits of hierarchy. OK, so um, and here I should also mention like in, in neuroscience is general, general, uh, definitely one of the big inspirations, but also just kind of a amazement at what humans can do as a parent and just a, looking at uh, um, all sorts of things <laughs> um, in the world. So in general, humans learn through a curriculum. They start with simpler tasks. Partly it's the parents that give them these tasks, but it's also um, their various arguments for uh, even their perception of the world is maybe uh, going to be restricted earlier on. And later on, um, once they've developed uh, initial representations, let's say, then it will be already a different access to the outside environment. So. Um, Sort of to, to mention that there are um, there's evidence, for example, that uh, um, in in the visual system that early stages uh, are learning before higher stages uh, are um, begin their learning, and this is just in the first few days and weeks uh, after birth, and that's the sort of uh, um, theme that I want to delve into a little bit mathematically. So. Um, when a child is watching objects move around like this, there's nobody who's saying all the time, this is a pen, this is a pen, this is a pen, this is a pen. The child is presumably doing something useful, learning something from all of this. And then later on, later in life, you can say to the child, this is my pen. And very quickly from just one example, they will, they will understand. So what is this useful process that's been going on earlier in life? And it's clearly some kind of invariant <coughs> representation, so that the, the, at least there's an awareness that this is the same object that persists throughout. OK, so um, this, uh, so, so as I was saying, that after, after the child has been exposed to sort of simple tasks, then um, it's in a position to learn complex tasks, sometimes from very few examples. And these examples are not the same as for previous tasks. So this is the sense in which I want to look at multi-step learning, where we initially have one sort of data set where we can, which can be used to train one module. And then this can be, that can subsequently be used um, in further learning tasks. So, and I, I want to emphasize that the, the tasks themselves are hierarchical. And so I will be talking also about um, hierarchical reinforcement learning in that sense. And some of these, once again, these themes are sort of echoes of themes that are relevant even in a feedforward architecture that you have reuse of submodules, um, invariances play a role, and so on. So the only extra ingredient is that now I want to consider what happens when we can train first on one kind of data and, and then um, use that in subsequent steps. <coughs> 
So the main themes that I'll address are representation learning. And another big um, part of this is sort of partial observability or partially labeled data. And so when I was mentioning that there are sort of different data sets that we would learn from, the point is that we may be learning from plentiful unlabeled data at one stage, unlabeled in the sense that it's not fully labeled for the final learning task, and then later learning with relatively um, few examples of more fully labeled data. And I'll, I'll sort of highlight an analogy here between semi-supervised learning and, and uh, reinforcement learning. And um, sort of uh, the, the distributional theme that I want to uh, kind of focus on for most of the talk has to do with a, a learning environment in which uh, learning of these various things proceeds. OK, so as I was mentioning, I'm, I'm mostly going to uh, focus on uh, two paradigms. So it'll be semi-supervised learning and um, hierarchical reinforcement learning. And um, I'll spend most of the time talking about semi-supervised learning. And I'll describe a, a point of view which is slightly different from the usual um, PAC framework for learning. But um, it's a, a, a way in which one can um, get some sort of insight about semi-supervised learning. And that's not possible in the typical PAC frameworks. And then um, I'm going to bring in a short discussion about hierarchical reinforcement learning to show some analogies that the sort of insights one gains from that approach to semi-supervised learning also give rise to certain insights in the context of hierarchical reinforcement learning. So this is actually, uh, uh, this illustration is, let's just think of it as an illustration for hierarchical planning in general. If you're going to try to build a souffle, you, you have certain subroutines. So here there's like one subroutine making ganache, making egg whites. This is not actually the kind of recipe that I would follow. But anyway, this is like any kind of uh, sort of more complicated task you're doing. It has various subroutines. We tend to think of things in, in that manner. And so the idea here is that these subroutines may have been learned, or the agent may have been trained on these in other sort of contexts, and can then call on them in a, in a, um, it, with a sort of a hierarchical control. So that's just to give a little bit of a, an illustration for people who are not working in hier hierarchical reinforcement learning. But I also mentioned POM DPs, and that's uh, partially observed Markov decision processes. So that's uh, a variant could be in the hierarchical context or in the non-hierarchical context. But this notion of partial observability, I'm going to kind of drive home a, a, an analogy between that and partial labels in the semi-supervised um, paradigm. OK, so before I get going, I just want to say that uh, the, this work that I'm going to talk about today was um, triggered by ideas of uh, Parthen Yogi, who is my supervisor at, uh, at Chicago and um, who passed away very young um, while I was doing my studies. So this is a former student of, uh, of Tommy's. And that's partly how I met up with everybody here. Um, and so in, in this uh, technical report of his, uh, he had been looking at some uh, formal mathematical um, um, analyses to understand the benefit of semi-supervised learning, in particular um, manifold, uh, manifold learning. And uh, in that paper, there's a sort of a key example to illustrate his ideas. And that's something that uh, I, I built on my thesis work and then also in this uh, um, paper and a subsequent paper with similar ideas in, um, for reinforcement learning. And so even though these are, are very mathematical, um, the actual papers, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to try to, like I was saying, avoid a lot of the math detail and just uh, emphasize the, the, the ideas involved. Um, but really, all of this uh, was triggered by this original um, example, actually, of, of Parthas, and then trying to generalize the principles that are at play in that example. Um, and I also have current collaborators with whom I'm working on some of the ideas that I'll be talking about today. So one is Georg Nordhoff, who's a, a neuroscientist at Ottawa. So actually, not just a neuroscientist, but also a um, psychiatrist and philosopher. He's a very multidisciplinary person. Um, and then two people at, uh, in Montreal, Prakash Pangaden and uh, Guillaume Rabusseau. So they're both um, doing, they're in machine learning, but doing very mathematical work in, in that context. And then some students, uh, Vincent Letourneau, Scott Parkinson, and Alex, uh, Alexander Shumarov. OK, so as, as I was uh, mentioning, I'm going to uh, focus on these two paradigms, semi-supervised learning and reinforcement learning. And so now let me just uh, lay a little bit of the groundwork in uh, semi-supervised learning to sort of describe the, the setup. 
So how many people are, are familiar with this uh, completely? OK. Um, OK, so um, th at the very beginning, what I've written here, we're trying to predict some function from, let's say, a space x to a space y, typically called the labels. Right here, what I've written could just be a supervised learning problem. If you are given examples like this of pairs x, y, then you can try to get a machine to learn the mapping from x to y. It may be that there's a, a, a fixed y associated to each x. That's a non-noisy case, or more commonly in, in the real world, um, to each x, there's a probability distribution of probability of y given x. And so which would be then the, the case of noisy labels. So um, all of that would just be supervised learning. However, um, oops, sorry. Um, if we additionally allow ourselves samples that are just samples from x, then, um, uh, and, and, there's a, so, so, and we have an algorithm that can take advantage of these samples from x to improve its performance, let's say, on the actual supervised learning task, then this is a, a semi-supervised algorithm. So manifold learning is considered to be uh, an example like this, and there are various other ones. And um, so I'm actually going to extend this slightly. So here, uh, typically, one considers adding in unlabeled samples, x1 up to xm. But I'm going to also consider adding in time sequences of unlabeled data. But just uh, in case there is a certain group action going on, um, it can be very informative to the agent to see um, samples as they appear in time. So this is uh, inspired by this case of a child seeing an object move through its visual field. Um, that's time sequence data of unlabeled instances. OK, so that's the basic setup. Um, and um, then one can ask, what is the value of unlabeled data? What's the use of these extra x1 up to xm that, that don't have any labels on them? And so they like, actually formulated in this, in this way. Um, Castelli and Cover, in a, in a couple of papers of theirs, were probably the first two to actually ask that question in that sense and to um, address it uh, carefully. And that was a, a, the main inspiration for the um, technical report of, of Parthas, of Partha Yogis, that I mentioned a few slides back that kind of triggered what I'm talking about today. Um, other people who've looked at this question are Balkan and Blum in a 2005 paper, and there, there are many others. Some people conclude unlabeled data is useless. Uh, some people conclude it's useful in this way or that way. Clearly, there are many cases in the real world where it's useful for something, so let's just try to understand this theoretically. And the reason I mentioned Balkan and Blum particularly is that there are a lot of uh, echoes between their approach and what I'm going to describe today. So um, let me just say a couple more words about that. So what they end up doing is they augment the PAC framework um, so, how many people know what this is? Okay, so um, I'll talk about that in, a, in another slide. Um, this is a sort of mathematical formalism, in a sense, uh, for analyzing um, learning. And uh, um, it's uh, become very widespread in machine learning. There are many variations on it, and so on. But um, it's not suitable for semi-supervised learning. It's not suitable to analyze semi-supervised learning, and I'll explain why in a moment. So Balkan and Blum augmented that framework by introducing, in addition, a compatibility function. And um, based on they use that, they show that you can, if, if you have one of these, then you can use this to reduce the concept class. And all of these terms I'm going to, to come back to in a moment. Um, but uh, this theme of reduce, so reduce is maybe not quite the right word, restrict uh, in some sense, alter the concept class basically to make a simpler learning problem. That theme is something in common with what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so let's uh, um, look at what is the, the PAC framework. So it's a, 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 um, a framework introduced by Valiant in the early 80s and um, this uh, little quote here is just from a, 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 machi a, a machine learning textbook uh, by Mori and colleagues. So I should also um, mention, since the audience is not coming from computer science, a concept class. So remember, we were, lear we were trying to predict some function that goes from x's to y's. And uh, the concept class um, governs 
all the possible relationships that these x's and y's could, could have together in this setting. So in other words, it's a, the Klesak class is a collection of functions from x to y. And um, our agent is going to try to, to um, come up with a hypothesis that's also a function from x to y. And for this simplicity here, we may as well assume it's being drawn from that actual concept class. So that means that the hypothesis class and the concept class, let's just assume they're the same for now. So um, one can describe a learning problem in terms of its under associate underlying concept class. And a concept class is said to be pack learnable if there exists an algorithm and a polynomial such that for any epsilon and delta and for all distributions d on x and any target concept c, you have this uh, sort of bound on risk. And I'm going to delve into that. Um, that applies for any sample that's larger than this polynomial expression. OK, so here, this is the, the source of the probability PAC, stands for probability, sorry, probably approximately correct. And the, um, that's because this is saying with high probability, so with probability at least 1 minus delta, we have that the risk is less than or equal to epsilon. This is saying that our hypothesis is approximately correct. And what is the risk? The risk is just some expected loss, where loss measures how, um, um, how far off our prediction is from the true concept. Okay, so this is a statement saying with high probability, the, um, the risk of our hypothesis, the, the um, extent to which it's bad, is less than or equal to epsilon. So back in that previous slide on SSL, I just said we're going to try to find some sort of map H from X to Y, and I didn't specify what properties that map should have. We want to find a map that has low risk. That's the goal. OK, so notice that this definition here, um, there's also a, a version for P concepts. And so that's this other uh, situation I was mentioning when the labels are noisy, where instead of just a class of functions from X to Y, you would have a class of probability distributions, Y given X. That would serve as your concept class. It's called a p-concept class then. In, in, but the rest of the definition would be the same in that setting. So I should mention this p-concept variation on that uh, arose 10 years later, roughly, uh, from Kearns and Shapire. And the original definition of pack learning you see here is from Valiant in 84. OK, so both of these things involve a distribution-free worst-case analysis. Because right here, you say, for all distributions d on x. So that's a very drastic kind of statement, right? <laughs> um, out in the real world, um, that's just not the situation. You're not trying to learn with any possible distribution on x. Um, but in particular, when you're wanting to look at semi-supervised learning, that's a big problem, because um, you're trying to ask, what's the value of this unlabeled data? Well, here, this whole framework is only looking at what an algorithm can do for all distributions d on x. And if you consider arbitrary distributions d on x, then having a, a sample of data from x is just going to tell you about what d is. It's not going to tell you anything about the actual um, underlying concept that you're trying to learn. Okay, so, th so this is just uh, inherently not suited to, uh, to, sem to analyze semi-supervised learning in its raw form. OK, so that's why um, Balkan and Blum proposed this um, augmentation of that to add in the extra notion of a compatibility function. And, uh, and then it, it says how compatible. Um, so if you see a bunch of unlabeled data, that gives you a sense of the um, um, distribution D. And then with this extra gadget, which is the compatibility function, you also can, can measure how um, compatible such a D is with, the, with co various concepts. And you'll only search for concepts within a smaller class of those concepts that are close to D, that are compatible with D. So that's kind of the way their argument proceeds. But you have this extra gadget that you kind of invented and added in there. Okay. Um. Okay, so let me just go back to this kind of setting. When we have a child learning um, from seeing objects moving around, it's really not true that, so let's say that the object itself is the unlabeled data, and then the name of it, like pointer, is the label. So it's really not true that all of this um, unlabeled data that it, that it comes in, 
you know, that it can be sampled from an arbitrary distribution. We're not going to judge a child based on how well it can learn in any kind of weird distribution where suddenly there's one object and another one and another one like that, right? There's clearly uh, a, um, some sort of space of naturally occurring images, and um, that's, of course, specific to the actual agent. So the agent finds itself in a particular environment, and within that environment, there's some kind of probability distributions that govern what kind of uh, data may be seen. So um, I'm going to focus on, on that aspect to try to characterize in as simple uh, manner as possible the, um, the agent's environment. But in what, what is it we need to know about the agent's environment? We need to know something about the probability distributions that are uh, coming out of that. OK, so this is the distributional point of view that I want to take. I'm going to assume a joint distribution P on um, x cross y comes from some statistical model. So a statistical model is a uh, sort of formalism that's been used for years in, in statistics. It's just a family of joint distributions. So we've got a joint statistical model. It's a family of joint distributions on x cross y. Possibly parameterized, not necessarily. Um, so there's some similarity between some echoes of um, Baxter's notion of learning environment. Uh, in a 2000 paper, he set up a sort of formalism for studying transfer learning. That's when you have a machine or a, or a biological agent that's acquiring skill in one task and then transferring, then later having an advantage in um, learning f another skill. And uh, so that formalism puts these skills within a common <laughs> learning environment. So a learning environment in Baxter's sense is uh, there is a calligraphic P, but it's the collection of all distributions on x cross y. And then um, he assumes in addition a prior Q, which uh, says which of the, how likely these various distributions are. So suppose you take the ones that are impossible, that have probability 0, according to that prior Q, and throw them away, then what you're left with is essentially a statistical model of, of distributions that may occur, together with this uh, additional prior, which says how likely you think they are. So I'm not going to go so far as to put a prior on how likely different distributions are. That may, there may be settings in which that's quite um, useful and so on, but let's just start simple. Let's at least take a collection of probability distributions that may occur. So P, for in the uh, rest of this talk, will be a statistical model that uh, um, it's a family of distributions that, that uh, our data may be coming from. OK, so ev all this is, these are joint distributions. So every P in there is, can be written in this form. We can write it as a marginal times a conditional. And it's actually this conditional that we're after. We want to know, let's say, maybe the conditional has all of its probability concentrated at one value. Then that's the label we're trying to predict. Or maybe it's just uh, some sort of um, more spread out distribution over labels. And we might want to know its expectation. We're basically trying to access this. Um, and sort of a theme that uh, I wanted to delve into are representations. So let's suppose there's a representation. So in, in these uh, um, <coughs> models where we see sort of learning proceeding al along to this stage, and then based on what's um, that sort of transformation so far, one does further learning. In that kind of situation, there's essentially a representation from the original um, space x to some new space t. And the key thing is that we can still do our final learning problem based on the t values. We don't need to go back to x. So this representation is sufficient. This map t is sufficient for the parameter of interest. So in, in this case, let's just assume it's, there's some parameter theta here for this conditional that we're after. And so um, this sufficiency that I'm describing is actually a stronger form of sufficiency than, than um, what you would usually say. Um, because we're, it's a kind of sufficiency that's tailored to the situation of a joint statistical model. Normally, one would just describe it for a particular parameter, but here it's in this context of a joint model. And um, so this is not a standard definition, but it's basically the same theme as the usual notion of sufficiency. So um, we, this t is sufficient if you can write the final um, p theta as some row of theta that's y given t of x. OK, so um, we'll, in a moment, start. We'll talk about uh, various examples so you can get a feeling for, for what this means. 
But basically, we're just taking the original x, we're converting that to some other t of x, and then we're going to look at how the final y values depend on t, instead of asking how they depend on the original x. So why would we want to do that? What's the advantage of that? That's what we'll talk about. So notice that when you're doing semi-supervised learning and you have access to um, plent plentiful unlabeled data, you can narrow down, possibly, um, the marginal. Suppose the data is coming from some p that lives in this uh, joint model. Then with plentiful unlabeled data, you can potentially get a very good idea of this marginal distribution. And then the, there is a natural projection, which just takes uh, this uh, PXY and maps it to here. So the fiber, that's the pre-image of, of a particular PX here, will be all of these conditionals that can occur together with that marginal. So when you're doing semi-supervised learning and you have all this um, unlabeled data, you're getting a hold on this, uh, sorry, this, this marginal here. And then that means that essentially you really only need to search within a reduced concept class corresponding to the pre-image of pi. So if we add in an extra representation, then this is further kind of reduced, and we're actually dealing with this projection that goes to marginals with respect to t. So here I would just be um, uh, writing this expression as p of uh, ty is equal to p sub t of t, and then times p of y given t. t very analogous expression would hold. And similarly, then we would be searching in a fiber of this map. OK, so um, just to, to emphasize kind of the, the commonality with what Balkan and Blum were doing, we're seeing once again that uh, um, we're searching in some sort of restricted class, but this restricted class is just arising because of the statistical model. So we, we assume a statistical model, then automatically to every marginal, there's only a certain collection of conditionals that are relevant. And you can do then an approximate version of this, and you would come up with something that's very similar to the compatibility function of Balkan and Blum. It's just that it's arising without having to introduce an extra gadget. It's arising from a simple assumption on what is the joint statistical model. OK, so um, in this context, I'm, I'm going to try to um, ask, what is the value of unlabeled data? And to do that, um, I'm uh, as often to get these sort of upper and lower bounds on risk. Um, we make use of measures of complexity. And um, since this whole thing is expressed in terms of statistical models, I'm, I'm introducing a, a notion of complexity for statistical models, which is really analogous. I've written here a simplified version just so we don't get bogged down in technical details. There are more elaborate versions of this to deal with noise. This is a non-noisy version with some extra simple assumptions in here. Um, but just to give a flavor of it, it's very similar in spirit to VC dimension. So people who know of that will, will recognize this here. Um, and, and what is it saying? So um, if you don't know VC dimension, don't worry. We just uh, You can just take this. Uh, definition for now. Um, so we'll say that this uh, statistical model P has gamma uniform shattering dimension at least n. If we can find disjoint subsets and a whole bunch of a sort of subfamily of distributions within P, such that the marginals of those distributions each assign some basic amount of measure to um, every SI. But the conditionals are as wild as possible. So what I mean by that, more precisely, is that the conditionals, um, these conditional expectations, expectation under p of y given x, should be constant on each si. So that if you have a, a, an x value that's coming from s1, then um, for all of those different x values in the set s1, you should get the same conditional um, expectation of sorry, yeah, additional expectation of y given x. It's basically saying that we're associating the same label to every x in, in, in this set uh, S1. And likewise, for S2, we have a, a certain label. So we essentially get set functions. We get, uh, for each set, we have a label. And um, then what we're, um, what we're going to require is that these set functions shatter S1 up to Sn. That means that I can choose any uh, 
map any sort of assignment of, of zeros and ones to these S1 up to Sn's. So there's two to the n of those possible as assignments. Those are called dichotomies. There's two to the n of them. And um, we want these conditionals, these conditional expectations, to uh, um, be varied enough that we can get all of those possible labelings. So just the, the, the sort of take home message of this, if this is kind of too much technicality to absorb in a, in a <laughs> short time, the take home message is that the marginals are giving a certain weight, a, a reliable amount of weight to each of these sets SI, but the labels are varying as much as we want them to, as drastically as we want. So a situation like that is a, is a measure, if you have that, then that's a certain um, statement of complexity of the model, and um, then you can prove lower bounds on risk. So it'll say that the risk will then be um, at least this amount. So basically the model is sufficiently complex that the risk will be, you're, you're, you're never going to be able to get your expected loss below a certain amount. It's going to be hard in that sense to learn. Okay, so what I'm going to discuss is uh, just uh, at finite sample size always. Um, this is a statement, this, this lower bound holds only for sample sizes below um, a, a, a certain number that comes from this n here. So, but basically when you, your model has that kind of complexity property for this n, um, then if the sample size is, is too small, you'll be condemned to have high risk. That's kind of what this is saying. Okay, um, so the it's easier to understand this if we look at concrete examples. So the two semi-supervised learning settings that I'm going to look at are manifold learning and group invariant feature learning. So you have a group action, and let's say the conditionals that you're interested in, let's say they're invariant under the action of this group. So for example, here this label uh, pointer that I'm putting onto this object, it's invariant no matter what kind of uh, transformation I um, use to modify the image that my eyes are seeing, of these naturally occurring uh, geometric transformations, this is still a pointer. Okay, that label is invariant under these transformations. So these are transformations of X, of the unlabeled data, but the labels are invariant under those. So um, I'll, I'll go into an example of that um, right after this, but first of all, let's talk about a manifold learning example, which was the original motivation for the, the technical report of Parthas that I mentioned. Okay, so here is kind of a, an ugly simplified um, manifold. It's a piecewise linear one. Let's, let's uh, if, to make it a little bit nicer, imagine that it doesn't have these corners. Just think of some simple closed curve. And I intended this to be oriented, but I forgot to draw the arrow. So let's say it's going around clockwise. And um, let's suppose that labels are assigned um, one, where we have this uh, um, dotted part, and zero outside of that. So it's a very simple sort of scheme for labeling. We just take some subsegment here, and we assign ones there, and we have zero outside. So if you happen to have uh, circle coordinates for this thing, then the labels, in terms of those coordinates, would be very simple. They would just be, um, actually, well, okay, I won't try to draw it. <laughs> Um, you would just have some um, theta value, let's say angle, where the um, ones uh, start and an angle where they stop. That sector would be ones and the rest would be zeros. And you can, for example, check the VC dimension of this. Um, so, so that would be a simple learning problem. If you have a, sort of, a, if you already have these uh, circle coordinates, then the labels depend on the circle coordinates in a very simple way. However, if your agent is faced with um, data that comes from some embedded manifold, but you don't know which embedded manifold, then it's actually a hard learning problem. And so I'm going to show you how, um, so I'll, I'll describe the class P that, uh, um, that I, so I've, I haven't given you the mathematical definition of P yet. I've just kind of hand waved. We're going to consider embedded curves with this kind of labeling. But let me specify more precisely what I mean by that. I mean that we're going to allow the x data to come from any, uh, we'll take an embedded curve and we'll allow the x data to come from that embedded curve. And then we will assign the labels in the manner that I've just described here. So there's a huge variety in terms of possible marginal distributions. It could be any embedding 
of a curve in, in the plane. So it's even a non-parametric um, marginal model right there. On the other hand, the conditional model of the labels given the um, circle coordinates would be very simple. OK, so let's see how that measure of complexity applies to that statistical model. So the definition said, um, to we'll say our model has um, this gamma, gamma uniform shattering dimension at least n. If we can find these n sets, so that the, um, we've got a bunch of distributions p that assign sufficient probability to those sets, but do wild stuff with the, um, with the labels. OK, so the sets in question here, just ignore these first top two. This, this is a very uh, convoluted looking picture, but it's still a piecewise linear embedded curve. It's just kind of deformed into a sort of maze shape, but it's still a closed curve. You can check. And for, for right now, just ignore this very, these top two wires, horizontal wires there. And let's just focus on the ones that come down below. So the sets SI um, that I want to talk about um, are, the, this will be set S1. It'll be the pair, this pair of wires right there. And then S2 will be this pair of wires. S3 will be that pair of wires. S4 will be that one, and so on. So suppose um, I want to uh, um, put labels on S1 up to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to S6, like this, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. This, is a, uh, this particular distribution here would be uh, one that realizes that. So we see where the ones are. Those are on these. Uh, heavy dotted regions. So this set, that's S5, has a 1. And this set here, that's S2, right here, that has a 1. And we have a label 0 on the others. So using examples like this, you can show that that huge class P, that's joint statistical model that I described before, that consists of all these possible embedded manifolds and then together with a simple way of labeling, that huge class has uniform shattering dimension uh, and in fact, you can, you can take more elaborate versions of this and, and uh, show that it has gamma uniform shattering dimension at least n for any n by slightly adjusting the n. And so in that extreme case, learning is impossible. You'll never be able to drive your risk down to zero using unlabeled data. Sorry, using, um, using raw data without uh, access to the circle coordinates. OK, however, the other learning problem that I mentioned with, uh, based on circle coordinates would be very simple. So if you have a lot of unlabeled data and you can first of all then learn some sort of manifold coordinates, then um, after that initial phase, which used maybe plentiful but unlabeled data, then you can um, learn the actual labels. So what you end up having is you, you can prove a gap here. This is the infimum over all algorithms that are supervised of the risk. It'll be bounded above some sort of uh, quantity. And um, here I've written the risk of an algorithm that's got oracle access to manifold coordinates. That algorithm's risk, will, we can upper bound. So there's this gap between not using the manifold coordinates and using the manifold coordinates. OK, so I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, this sort of theme also occurs in an example of group invariant feature learning, which I'll describe in a minute. Um, so for this example, um, this is just a rectangle right here that I've drawn. And so it's an interval i here and an interval j. And I'm going to imagine that's what these two arrows are trying to uh, symbolize. I'm going to imagine that I've connected those two edges that have the arrows. So that actually, this, the object that I'm looking at is uh, an annulus like this. OK, and now um, we have S1, that's this circle group, let's say, acting on this. So it's pushing, this is my x. This weird space here is x. And uh, if we sample data, let's say it's just sampled uniformly along here, so we can get uh, unlabeled data points along here. Okay, 
At the same time, we have the circle group S1 acting on this space. And let's say it's doing that. Uh, these are the flow lines of how it acts on the space. So it's pushing a uh, pushing an x point here along this orbit. Let's suppose that the labels are assigned in a very simple way um, in terms of those orbits, so that there's some kind of threshold orbit along here. And it could be one of these other orbits, but some threshold orbit. Above that orbit, we have label 1. And below that orbit, we have label 0. OK, so if the learner were given access to um, the quotient group of x mod s1, which just means some sort of uh, um, listing of these orbits, that would essentially just be i. If, if we had access to that, um, then we could very easily, uh, so any, for any, any point out here, we would just immediately know where does it come from on this original vertical line. If we knew that, then we could very easily say what kind of label it should have, because the labels depend in a very simple way on those coordinates. OK, but if we're just given this raw picture, the, uh, the group action could be very convoluted. And then it will be hard for us to, um, to, to guess the label, to predict the label. So once again, to, to get at how hard it is, I'm going to use this notion of gamma uniform shattering. And um, what we need to do to show that we have th that this, so once again, I didn't really describe the statistical model, but it's supposed to be that space x. Um, and then the uniform marginal on x. And the probability of y given x will basically be label 1 above one of these weird orbits and label 0 below the orbit. So the, the, the uh, variety comes from the fact that these orbits can be very convoluted. Okay. So that was this joint statistical model. And now let's see what its uh, gamma uniform shattering dimension is. So um, we need to find um, n sets, s1 up to sn, and, and see that we have marginals assigning uh, sort of the same probability there. That's easy because um, these, all these marginals are just the uniform distribution in this example. And the conditionals should be able to, uh, to give us any kind of dichotomy. So this is an illustration. The sets are these uh, s1, s2, s3, s4, the white regions. And um, the dichotomy that I'm illustrating here is 0, 1, 0, 0. So this dotted line here is that threshold orbit. And the threshold orbit, you know, if, if this action of S1 can be very convoluted, it, it might very well be like this. That's one of the guys in our big class P. And uh, for any dichotomy that we come up with, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, we can do a similar kind of, we can find a similar convoluted action that would produce that. So this kind of uh, joint model has a, um, a high gamma uniform shattering dimension. And I'll sort of avoid all the, the sort of technical details. But once again, we achieve some sort of uh, gap between the risk of uh, a learner that's just faced with raw x and y data versus uh, um, an agent that has oracle access to this uh, um, list of orbits. OK, so those are the two settings. And it's a kind of technical to compute the gamma uniform shattering dimension. But this is just a mathematical formalism. Um, it's obviously, on the one hand, it's an oversimplification of the real situation. On the other hand, it's kind of a complicated and technical to compute it. But the point is the, the um, insight that it gives. It's just one of these. Uh, these are very naturally occurring types of joint, uh, joint models. And there are situations where we have some kind of inherent complexity, although in terms of, an, of a representation, an intermediate representation, we have much less complexity. And the difference in those two is responsible for this gap. OK, so. Um, are there any questions about this, <laughs> this particular example? Not necessarily a converse in that sense, but you could potentially, if you if you know that. So I only to, uh, gave a definition for the gamma uniform shattering dimension being at least n. But if you knew that it was less than n, then you can potentially devise an algorithm that would give you an upper bound instead of a lower bound. 
So here I've actually only used the, the, this uh, kind of novel measure of complexity to produce this lower bound. Um, but uh, that, that's a nice idea. Maybe that's true, that if you have a situation where you, you find that there is a, um, a, a gap that cannot be bridged, perhaps that's actually an indicator that there, that there is some kind of factorization underneath. Yeah. So I should also mention that the, these lower bounds that I obtained, so in general, when one uses uh, quantities like uh, VC dimension or fat shattering dimension and others to derive lower bounds in the PAC learning framework. So remember in PAC learning, we are, we're looking at worst case bounds for arbitrary D. Those lower bounds that say the risk of any algorithm will be at least this amount, those are always, uh, you end up cooking up a bad distribution D. And then you show, well, for this distribution, you'll have this kind of uh, risk that's, that's um, bounded below by some number. So, um, so, so that's a place where this bad, this kind of arbitrariness of D um, is quite important. Whereas in, in this uh, framework here, um, the lower bounds are actually proved uh, for marginals that occur naturally in that joint model. So not arbitrary um, marginals, but only ones that, that might occur in, in, under this assumption of a, of a joint model. Okay, so let me just um, mention also a, a, another sort of a, sort of a corollary of that sort of uh, the collection of examples of group invariant features you, and the analysis that you can do with gamma uniform shattering. Um, you can show there's sort of various choice settings where you can set up instead of a, an S1, so S1 is this group of circle transformations, and if you discretize that, you would have what, what's called ZK. So it's uh, the integers mod K. It's basically all these like, K discrete shifts to make up a whole turn instead of a circle transformation. Okay, so um, if you look at a setting where you have the group uh, Zn1 cross Zn2, this is the integers up to N1 and the integers up to N2, acting on X, and the labels are invariant under that, then um, you get a lower bound on sample complexity that, that's N1 plus N2 if you do two-step learning. At each step, you have an, like an N1 lower bound at first and then an N2 lower bound. That's if you learn, first of all, invariant features under one of the factors and then invariant features under the other. Whereas um, to, to do this in a flat architecture would require N1 times N2 sample complexity. So this is a much larger sample complexity. And this kind of um, uh, comparison between uh, addition versus product is also something that appears in uh, this uh, sort of a memory-based factorization theorem by, by Tommy and, and others from 2012. So in that case, it was a similar kind of statement about memory of, of additive versus multiplicative memory requirements in a particular architecture. And a similar kind of thing is, is showing up here in terms of sample complexity. Okay, so. Um, so let me just uh, um, then briefly delve into hierarchical reinforcement learning, and I should stop um, soon, so I won't go too much into this. The example that I've, I've um, so I'll, I'll just very quickly skip over the, the, the definition of the setup, because um, some of you may be familiar already with it. And um, basically, we have uh, a Markov decision process that, that encodes so what that is, is it's just uh, specifying states, actions, transition probability to go from one state to another via actions, and reward. Um, a partially observed version of that is one where instead of seeing the actual state, the agent just sees some observation, and you have also uh, specified a probability of an observation for a particular state after some action. So this is kind of the formalism. Um, behind this terminology of, of um, MDPs and POMDPs. And the job of the agent is to find a policy, which is a map from states to actions. So in any given state, the agent should find out what sort of action is the optimal one to do in order to um, have the greatest expected re reward. We can also express that by saying the agent is looking for, um, is aiming to find, to obtain the lowest regret. And I mention it that way because then it's sort of more clear the analogy with uh, supervised learning or semi-supervised learning where we're looking for this map H with lowest risk. Here we're looking for a map from S to A with lowest re regret. So, um, okay, so 
in terms of hierarchical reinforcement learning, this just means that we have a uh, kind of hierarchy in time. There's some hierarchical planning possible. And um, there are what are, no, let's look at the particular example of options. So these are essentially, you have some region of state space where you can initiate an option and there's a condition for ending the option and some policy that's specified. So if you call an option, then the agent is going to, in some term, initiation state, it will just follow this policy for a while until it gets terminated and then it passes control up higher. So this is like this, this notion here. Here we're involved in one option. This is a policy that we're following until it terminates. And the termination condition is maybe, you know, that the ganache is smooth enough or something. Then we stop that, we pass control back to the upper agent, and then the upper agent will start the next subroutine and so on. Okay, so that, that uh, creates a kind of hierarchy of con control. And I won't go into the technical details here, but you can come up with an artificial sort of reinforcement learning example so that the previous uh, s uh, statements about semi-supervised learning um, give you a gap. And here, though, the gap is um, that an agent that does not have access to options will have a uh, provably um, lower reward than an agent that has access to options. So the analogy that's uh, kind of being cooked up here is these um, options are sort of like the intermediate representations before. And they can be learned even under in this model that I set up here. They can actually be learned under partial observability, just the way the intermediate representations could be learned with partially labeled data. So kind of in summary, um, the sort of general benefit of multi-step learning that I'm trying to uh, get at with this uh, mathematical formalism is that intermediate representations are useful when they induce a factorization of the learning problem to one of lower complexity. And we sort of access that with this um, VC dimension, for example, was very low. And before, it used to be a high complexity with that uh, gamma uniform shattering dimension that we had calculated. And then the other message that th these representations that are useful can sometimes be learned from sort of cheaper, partially labeled or observed data. <laughs>